Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. We're honored to have a world-renowned clinician in the field of thoracic malignancy join us today, Dr. Jerushka Naidu from Ireland. With Dr. Naidu, we hope to discuss her approach to treating metastatic non-small cell lung cancer that have actionable mutation in first line. Let us get started. Dr. Naidu, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Naidu. Dr. Naidu, we have divided the non-small cell lung cancer algorithm in three parts, stage one to three, where the treatment, in fact, is from curative intent. Then stage four, with or without actionable mutations. Our focus today will be on stage four non-small cell lung cancer with actionable mutation in first-line settings. Here is the algorithm. Can we first start off with the importance of NGS testing and what are you exactly looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much for highlighting this. I think this is an area of emerging importance um, in thoracic oncology. What we've seen is really non-small cell lung cancer is the poster child for precision medicine. We've seen an expanding number of genomic targets that can represent either point mutations, insertions, deletions, or rearrangements. And with this expanding uh, list of genomic targets, the need to do comprehensive genomic testing becomes more and more paramount. So there are a number of ways of doing genomic testing. We know based on regulatory approvals that this could be done in theory as hotspot testing, meaning testing for individual mutations. Um, and while that might result in a faster turnaround time in some instances, it uses up the tissue very quickly particularly in patients with lung cancer where we often don't have large samples. So in major centers and, and now increasingly in, in both centers, larger panels using next generation sequencing are used because when you get to testing more than four, for more than four molecular alterations, doing a larger panel becomes more cost effective and of course more tissue efficient. So this can be done gold standard using tissue-based genotyping but also can be done in the form of liquid biopsy, which has the benefit of a faster turnaround time, um, but sometimes can also compromise on sensitivity. So our gold standard, of course, is tissue, but complementary approaches using liquid biopsy can often help with turnaround time. Um, and this really will allow us to identify the comprehensive list of genomic alterations you see in front of you that may inform a targeted treatment option. Thank you, Dr. Naidu. As we're talking about the biomarker testing, what will be the significance of DNA versus RNA testing when it comes to NGS? Yeah, so that's a great point. We know that that different testing platforms have different uh, rates of coverage um, or have different capabilities for detecting uh, DNA-based changes versus RNA-based changes. So we know that doing NGS testing can um, identify rearrangements and, and, and other um, uh, alterations that require an RNA-based approach. However, what we are also seeing is that molecular pathologists may confirm certain alterations using an orthogonal test, which means a second test, to confirm that that alteration is indeed present. So what our practitioners might sometimes see is that you would do an NGS-based test and then to confirm the presence of a particular alteration, you may do a subsequent test like an IHC. Sometimes some institutions may flip this on its head and do a, a short interval test first, like an IHC, and then confirm it with a larger panel. And I think there is ongoing debate in the field as to which way may be best to do it. Certainly my practice would be to do NGS first because this provides the broader sweep for the most molecular alterations. Perfect, thank you for answering that. Um, now, can we get started with one of the most common actionable mutations that we run into, the EGFR mutation? Here, ulcer martinib is often used as first line. What is your go-to anti-EGFR drug and any particular settings where you might consider using other agents? Sure. So I think in the first line setting, OC martinib has been established as a standard of care since the publication of the FLORA study. Um, and certainly for those with classic sensitizing mutations, which you see there in the top line, EGFR exon 19 deletion and L85 at our point mutation, OC Merchant would certainly be my go-to drug. In the rarer alterations, you see there on the second line, S768I point mutation, 
LA61Q and G719X. Again, osimertinib does appear to be uh, the best treatment option for these sort of rare subtypes. Shout out to one of my colleagues, Dr. Alfredo Adeo, who did a um, published a large study of the JTO recently called the Unicorn Study. Um, was retrospective, but still identified that in these rarer alterations, osimertinib still conferred a benefit. Um, I do think that afatinib may be considered in these patients as well because it has coverage of the t entire gene. Um, but we understand that T790M specific um, uh, targeted therapy is beneficial for these patients. Um, obviously, uh, exon 20 insertions are, are a separate beast. Um, to these, but certainly what is listed here, I think, is is what I would go with. Certain special circumstances, there are some data to suggest that combining erlotinib with a VEGF targeting, either with bevacizumab or ramacirumab, may be beneficial in certain circumstances, patients with leptomeningeal disease, for example, but I would probably hold that in the second line setting and still go OC merchant first line. Thank you for covering that. Unlike one popular anti-EGFR drug, we have pretty comparable ALK inhibitors up front. How do you select one ALK inhibitor or the other in this setting? Yeah, you know, I think um, ALK is really um, a um, a success story for oncogene-addicted lung cancer. We now have an embarrassment of Richard we have riches when it comes to targeted therapy, and this can only be a good thing. So I think the main question is regarding sequencing of treatments. So in the first line setting, I think alectinib and brigatinib are essentially interchangeable, um, very similar um, survival outcomes, response outcomes. I think the only difference is, of course, side effect profile. We know that brigatinib can be associated with an interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis, but actually this is... Um, uh, in subsequent studies uh, where this is a far more tolerable uh, toxicity than, than we would have imagined. And now, you know, lung cancer doctors are, are, um, are no strangers to the management of pneumonitis. So I, I really think either of these drugs interchangeable. And lectinib, of course, I think uh, there is a large level of comfort with giving this drug. It is very well tolerated. And I would say either one of those would be my go-to in the first line setting. Technically, lorlatinib could be an option here, but I think an ideal drug in the second line setting after either first line alectinib or brigatinib, and then our other options would, would fall in after that. Another area to highlight there, which isn't isn't mentioned here, but important, we know that pemetrexid-based chemotherapy can really help patients with alpha rearranged lung cancer, so I think that that is a very reasonable option as well. Absolutely. Thanks for covering that. Two important points here to reiterate is lung-specific side effects, especially when we are treating lung cancer patients, pneumonitis being a, one of the important ones one has to keep in mind. And again, the pemetrexid thing, uh, the chemotherapy option for alkyl inhibitors patients. Dr. Naidu, moving right along, for ROS1 rearrangement, we have entrectinib, which is also approved for entrect mutation. And then, of course, crizotinib, rest. Sertinib is not approved, but it's also used for this mutation. How do you select one of these mutations and what response rates do we have for this class of drug? Yeah, I think the response rates are somewhat similar. And um, obviously, entrectinib um, is a newer agent. Crizotinib has been around a little bit longer. So there has been a little bit more <laughs> clinical experience with the crizotinib, I would say. But I really, I would feel comfortable with either of those. I think, you know, uh, another important element to uh, for, for our practitioners to be aware of is sometimes it takes a while to get our testing back, right? So sometimes these patients may have had systemic chemotherapy in frontline. Um, I think in that instance, giving these treatments in second line isn't wrong. Um, and remember, writing out our treatment options uh, for as long as they are of benefit to patients is important. So I would say you know, uh, either of these is, is a reasonable option in this disease. Up next is BRAF V6 under E mutation. Recently, we saw an agnostic approval for this combination in solid tumor. Dr. Noid, your experience here? Yes, so I've had great experience with dibrafenib and trametinib. Actually, I've had several patients with BRAF V600 mutant non-small cell lung cancer who have had good responses to dibrafenib and trametinib. Uh, some of the, the toxicities that we see with this, uh, fevers, joint pain, I have definitely had to dose reduce treatment based on fevers um, a significant amount of time. It can actually really affect our patients day to day. 
Um, I think an important element, again, of the BRAF um, experience is, again, giving chemo IO isn't necessarily wrong in this setting. Um, so the dibrafenib trametinib could be given either first line or second line. I have given it in first line in most instances and had patients that have had deep and durable responses. Hopefully your patients will be the same. Um, and this is in line with, of course, the uh, the phase two planchet study um, that was published some years ago and then larger institutional and national series confirming response rates upwards of 50% in these patients. Certainly view experience of a similar uh, profile. Well, I realize we're going through this rather fast, but our hope is our community oncologists can find a quick nugget or a pearl to keep these mutations and treatment options in mind. We have touched on entrectinib for ROS1 rearrangement, but we also have lartrectinib in the space for NTREC mutation, which is your preferred agent and any clinical pearls for these two agents here? Well, my clinical pearl is I have actually never seen um, an NTRAC alteration. This is rarely um, a, a needle in a haystack situation. And uh, I often describe this as the golden needle in a haystack because it really is one in which there are deep responses are seen. Um, the data for larotrectinum and entrectinum appear quite similar. So um, I think here, uh, no, no obvious winner, but obviously if you find the alteration itself, uh, that that in itself is, is the benefit. Thank you, Dr. Naidu. To reiterate, these both NTREC agents have agnostic approvals in solid tumor and not just in lung cancer. And personally, I've actually treated a breast cancer patient with NTREC mutation that did well. Wow. Coming back to lung cancer, in the last two years, we've seen two new drugs being approved for metexon 14 skipping mutation. Dr. Naidu, you've mentioned that in some instances, we also use chemotherapy upfront. This is a similar instance. With this mutation, the particular patient could be exposed to chemoimmunotherapy upfront and then these actionable mutations. How do you decide on using this upfront versus second line? Yeah, I think that's a very, very important point. So here, I think again, the data for capmatinib, geometry lung one, topotinib study, they're all quite, they're all very similar, um, very similar response rates. Toxicity is very slightly different. Um, but here, I think, it depends on the tolerability. Taking your pdl one expression into account, taking the fitness of the patient into account, their personal preference about whether taking a, a pill therapy versus um, a, a intravenous therapy, um, all of these things have to be taken into account as to whether you would start with a targeted therapy versus chemo IO. I think it's hard to argue with the, the phase three data and the survival benefits of chemo IO so sometimes I keep these agents in second line. Certainly in a European context, these are often available more in the second line setting or on expanded access once patients have been exposed to chemo IO. So this is often where I'm using these drugs, but really I think either approach is very reasonable. Continuing along with the theme of tumor agnostic approval, RET rearrangement. Dr. Naidu, your thoughts on available options here? Yes, so sulpicatinib and pralcetinib, again, you're know, very happy to see that we now have targeted therapies in, in the space of ret rearranged lung cancer, which of course we didn't have until very recently. Um, I don't think there's a clear winner here either. Some very relevant features to decide on one agent versus another. We know that patients with oncogene addicted lung cancers do have a predilection for the brain. So assessing the response rates in the brain if your patient has um, has uh, this type of lung cancer and whether they had have brain meds, I think will factor into your decision. And again, toxicity profile. Um, we currently have an open study of pralcetinib. Uh, again, if you have a clinical trial, always uh, I would feel clinical trial is the best option, closer care for the patient, contributing to science. But I think here, if, uh, if either of these options were open as standard of care, I'd be more than happy um, to prescribe them. Perfect, Dr. Naidu. As we're coming closer and closer to end this conversation before we run away, if patients have progressed on these first-line oral agents outside clinical trials, do you retest all your patients with VPNGS? And do you use immunotherapy and chemotherapy in second line? Or how do you go about selecting your second line treatment? That is a wonderful question. And thank you for highlighting that. So I think... Um, 
in most cases, I will try to re-biopsy at the time of progression on a targeted therapy. This is of particular relevance for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer and even rarer types of EGFR mutation, exon 20 insertions, because we know in a proportion of these patients, we may see the development of secondary alterations or epithelial to mesenchymal transition and the development of a small cell component. So I think that is a reason to re-biopsy. If you see a change in the trajectory of a patient's cancer, where you're concerned that um, perhaps there, you know, there might have been a change in their molecular profile, I think doing a repeat biopsy, if it will guide your practice, is important. If your institution has access to a molecular tumor board, sometimes certain alterations may, may actually have nuances to their interpretation. I think the only exception to that really is probably ALK, because many of our choices in the downstream sort of second and third line settings do cover some of the resistance alterations. So that may be an exception, but most of the time I would advocate for rebiopsy. Um, even though I know that that's probably controversial and not everybody would do that, I think to, to look for the EMT and the secondary alterations, it is useful. So in the case of EGFR mutant lung cancer, we've seen a number of phase three trials read out recently confirming our suspicions that the immunotherapy is of limited benefit in these patients. So for those patients, I do not give immunotherapy and I would give them chemotherapy alone rather than chemo IO. Um, I would extrapolate this certainly to elk rearranged lung cancer as well. Um, we have seen very low response rates for single agent IO, and I think that that's a, a very reasonable um, approach. Importantly, I think in the rare oncogene addicted non small cell lung cancers, this um, thought process may not necessarily apply. For example, Patients with metexon 14 skipping non-small cell lung cancer, there have been reports demonstrating that certain patients may benefit from the addition of IO versus other versus not. So, so for these other rarer subtypes, I would still give chemoimmunotherapy, but I do think that there are pros and cons, and certainly um, we could be proven wrong in the future. Um, but that, as an example, is is one oncogene addicted subgroup that can uh, respond to immunotherapy, and therefore I would give it in that circumstance. Thanks for covering that. And now, if the molecular profile, in fact, has not changed, and the patient has limited progression on some areas while stable on the other, would you continue on with the targeted mutation and add chemotherapy to that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think if we have this oligometastatic progression, um, oligo confusion about <laughs> the, uh, the different types of progression that 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 exists i think first of all i try to eke out my targeted therapy for as long as possible so if there are a, a limited uh, number of areas and my friendly neighborhood radiation oncologist feels like they can radiate those areas i certainly try to do that and i continue with my targeted therapy if um there are there are areas of progression that are beyond the oligo metastatic paradigm then my practice would be to switch to chemotherapy. Um, however, I know that there is a, a growing body of evidence showing that adding targeted therapy to chemotherapy may be of benefit in certain circumstances. But I think at the time of progression, my practice would be to switch to chemotherapy. Thank you. Wow, we have covered a lot here. And the best way for me to summarize this is by reiterating the importance of NGS testing. Some of the retrospective data reports that 50% of these patients don't even get NGS testing. That is unfortunately subpar as these patients are deprived of phenomenal treatment options we have today. Again, if there's one thing that we want our community oncologists to walk away from this as the importance of NGS testing in all, all our small, non-small cell lung cancer patients. Dr. Naidu, thank you so much for covering such an important topic with us today. No problem, and thanks for highlighting it.